Welcome back to the Bishop's Corner here on Annunciation Radio with Bishop Daniel Thomas. I'm Ron Finn for Ron Miller, who one day will return to the Bishop's <laughs> Corner when he returns from vacation. Uh, and the uh, Bishop's Corner is heard on uh, lots of great radio stations throughout the Annunciation Radio family, including, of course, uh, WNOC 89.7 in Toledo. In Sandusky area, it's WHRQ at 88.1. Thank you for listening in the Brian Eden area on 89.9 WRRO. Also, uh, WSHB in Willard, 90.9 FM, and WFOT in Lexington, Mansfield at 89.5. Uh, folks, the Bishop's Corner is also carried by uh, other friends of, uh, of ours in Faustoria, WLBJLP, uh, and in, uh, in the uh, Lipsick area, uh, Holy Family Radio, WJTA, and in Tiffin at WSJG. Bishop Thomas, welcome to the Bishop's Corner. Thank you very much, Ron. Ron Finn, in for Ron Miller. And happy Easter to all of our good listeners and viewers, because the Easter season continues, as we know, for many weeks, and we continue to bask in the light of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. So, happy Easter season. And that's what's so beautiful, is uh, we think of uh, the long period of Lent leading up to, uh, to Easter, and the pinnacle there, uh, but really the Easter season just begins. And as we know, thankfully the Easter season is even longer, Ron, which is a great blessing. So those 40 days until the ascension of the Lord, and then of course 50 days of Easter completely until Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And uh, of course, uh, just uh, coming off of, uh, of Divine Mercy Sunday. Absolutely, and of course our gospel, as we always do, will be for the previous Sunday that we proclaim and then reflect upon. And I certainly hope so many of our good folks on that first Sunday after Easter had entered into the divine mercy of the Lord. Remember, it was Pope John Paul II that gave that as a feast day for the church. And, of course, he was the very one, Ron, I was discussing recently that, in fact, you know, he had known and read St. Faustina because, of course, she was a Polish sister. And, you know, he then became Holy Father and he was very well aware that, in fact, in her writings, she had had a vision that a pope would place the image of the Divine Mercy in a small church off of the Via Conciliazione in Rome. And in fact, I've had the blessing of visiting that church. So John Paul II, obviously knowingly and intentionally, fulfilled that vision of Faustina when he placed the Divine Mercy in that church. And so it's a, it's a really extraordinary reality of of a saint fulfilling another saint's vision, which is quite something. And of course, the vision of that day is that the mercy of Jesus is extended to all. And through that powerful image we have with the, the rays of light shedding from the heart of Jesus, the white and red rays symbolizing the baptism and the blood, the Holy Eucharist, the sacraments. And of course, that powerful wording, Jesus, I trust in you. So we continue through this Easter season to recognize the profound mercy of the Lord and trusting in his merciful love, which he has shown us in Easter. And Bishop, we know so many of our listeners and viewers uh, uh, pray the Divine Mercy uh, Chaplet, the Novena. Absolutely. Uh, from uh, really leading up to Divine Mercy Sunday. Certainly. And some not only did that Novena, but Ron, as we know, many of our listeners and viewers pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet on a daily basis. So what a gift. Yep, and of course that's heard uh, every uh, weekday uh, on, at 3 o'clock on Annunciation Radio. Beautiful. So, Bishop, uh, what else is happening? Uh, I'm surprised you're not on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not on vacation, Ron. And we have a number of things coming up, including uh, lots of confirmations, because it's confirmation season. But there is uh, one particular note that we wanted to make, and that was an event that's coming up on Tuesday, April 17th. And on Tuesday, April 17th, there'll be a Catholic Charities Diocese of Toledo event. And it's a spring gala. And the title is, I Served a Saint, because Mario Enzler, who had been a Swiss guard in the Vatican's military corps, will be there as the speaker to talk about his relationship with Pope John Paul II. And yours truly will talk about his relationship, having worked for John Paul II for 15 years at the Holy See. And so I would invite our listeners and viewers, if they would like to support Catholic Charities and attend that event, I'd be thrilled if they could. And they can go to Catholic Charities, NWO, Northwest Ohio, 
slash or dot org slash product slash gala or just go to the general website to get tickets and those tickets can be purchased through Monday April 9th and so we want to make sure that you get to join us for that gala come to have dinner hear some wonderful witnesses and support our Catholic charities and it's always good uh, a lot of times people are last minute and uh, if you if you call Catholic charities and, and ask uh, beyond the deadline uh, maybe you'll get they, it. they certainly might we we hope to pack them in Ron that's a great double header Mario Ensler and the <laughs> Bishop of uh, we'll just make it a single header and it'll be him <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a great thing uh, anything else uh, before we move to our thanks I think question? we should get right to the gospel don't you yeah let's do that thank you oh, good this is a, uh, a recent gospel uh, from John on the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst, and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and bring your hand, and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief, you may have life in his name. Bishop. Thank you. So, folks, we hear these marvelous Gospels during the octave of Easter. And, of course, this is the Gospel that closes that octave, the final eighth day. And it's the Gospel, we're even told by John, on the evening of that first day of the week. So, this is an appearance that night. And we hear this marvelous interchange between Christ and the Apostles his extending to them, his Easter peace, and the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, the back and forth with Didymus, or Thomas, who, for all of history, is known as the Doubting Thomas, sadly, but others have switched that around, and some scripture scholars say we should be calling him the Believing Thomas, because he put aside his doubts when he saw Jesus and placed his hands in Christ's hand and in his side. So one of the questions, I think, in this wonderful Easter time, we can ask ourselves is, we are ones who have not been blessed to see him physically in his person, but we have seen him in so many ways, and in a particular way, of course, not only seen him, but received him in the Holy Eucharist. And Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. So we ask ourselves for an increase in Easter faith, during these days, that we who have not seen with eyes of our body can continue to see with eyes of faith that Jesus Christ is risen, and no matter what violence, what difficulty, what physical challenges, what illness, what death, no matter the sin, that we might be able to see Jesus risen in our midst and be able to witness to his risen life. That's beautiful, and that's a beautiful gospel. There's so much depth in that gospel. Powerful gospel, and I, I usually mention, Ron, that that's the gospel from which my coat of arms as a bishop is taken, because the witness of Thomas, the resurrection confession of faith 
my Lord and my God, those are the words of my Episcopal motto. So mm -hmm. it's always a gospel special to me. That's beautiful. Well, Bishop, uh, I think we have time to sneak a question in here. Thank uh, you. Let's get one in, Ron. Yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, go to uh, Caroline, uh, who writes, she's listening on, our, on WRRO, and she says, Dear Bishop Thomas, I have attended our parish Easter vigil off and on for a few years. Why are there so many readings? I know that we are part of the Jewish tradition because Jesus came from a Jewish background and all that, but is it really necessary to read from the Genesis, etc.? We already know the story. <laughs> well, Caroline, I must confess this is a rather unique question, and you may already know the story, but there may be people sitting in that congregation of every church, including the people entering into the church, who may not know the full story. And of course, why do we have all those readings? Is it really necessary? Caroline, it's because the church invites us to do that. And so I would, I would say that the very fact that Easter is recounting the fullness of revelation of Jesus, that is his resurrection, and that he fulfills all of the law and the prophets, obviously the church wants to emphasize that fulfillment. Now, Caroline, I don't know where you go for the Easter Vigil, but of course, it's rare that all seven of the other readings, the Old Testament readings, are done. Most churches do four. But I think it's an important note, if I may, just to share with you what's on the USCCB, the bishop's website, regarding the Liturgy of the Word for the Easter Vigil. Here's what we read. One of the unique aspects of the Easter Vigil is the recounting of the outstanding deeds of the history of salvation. These deeds are related in seven readings from the Old Testament, chosen from the Law and the Prophets, and two from the New Testament, namely from the Acts of the Apostles and from the Gospel. Thus, the Lord, beginning with Moses and all the Prophets, meets us once again on our journey and opening up our minds and hearts at the vigil prepares us to share in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup. The faithful are encouraged to meditate on these readings by the singing of a responsorial psalm followed by silence and then a celebrant's prayer. The Missal adds a sentence about the nine readings proposed saying, all of these must be read whenever it can be done, so that the character of a vigil, which takes place over some time duration, can be observed. So, Carolyn, I hope you also understand that a vigil, the very nature of a vigil, is a period of time and preparation. And, of course, the Church has often called, I think one of the saints calls the Easter Vigil the mother of all vigils. So, I hope that's helpful in more deeply appreciating and understanding why, in fact, we would pray so many readings at the Easter Vigil. Such a beautiful vigil with the singing of the exalted and everything. So, Carolyn, uh, we thank you uh, for, for your question. Uh, Bishop, we're going to need to take a little break here. Sure. And uh, we will come right back. Stay here. with us, folks. Lots of questions to answer. Sunday, April 22nd, is the World Day of Prayer for Vocations. On this day, we are called in a special way to fulfill the Lord's instruction from the Gospels of Mark and Luke to pray the Lord of Harvest to send laborers into his harvest. We invite you to join this worldwide effort. Please pray for increased vocations to the priesthood, diaconate, and religious life, particularly in our Diocese of Toledo. We're back here on the Bishop's Corner with Bishop Daniel Thomas, and uh, we certainly welcome your questions. Uh, Bishop is always uh, eager to answer whatever question you might have, uh, and you can get those questions to the Bishop uh, quite easily. You can go to the AnnunciationRadio.com website and uh, just use the simple form there at Bishop's Corner, or you can just send a, a quick email uh, to Bishop at AnnunciationRadio.com. Uh, as always, uh, the bishop would like to know who he's talking to, so please include at least your first name and either your parish that you're from uh, or the town that, uh, that you're from. And uh, we certainly appreciate all those questions. And uh, Bishop, welcome back. Uh, we are going to go to another question. If you Absolutely. Want to keep and keep those rolling. questions, folks, because what we try to do is get at least right around five questions. We try to get at least in every show. So that's what we're working toward. And every now and then, as you know, we have to leave one or two off for next taping. 
but we're so grateful for the number of questions come in and the varied, really the varied topics that they represent. So we're always grateful and keep sending them in. Thank you. And Bishop, sometimes uh, we get calls from people who say, well, I, I sent a question in and I missed it that week. And, you know, but it's real easy. It's a very accessible show. Very helpful. You can, uh, you can find the uh, video of each of the Bishop's Corner on the Diocesan website as well as on the, uh, the radio station website. And, of course, the podcast is available for you to listen to later. That's right. So if you may have missed an answer, you can always go back and hear it again, right? That's right. Thank you. And let's uh, hear from Marilyn, uh, who is from Genoa, who says, Dear Bishop Thomas, thank you for putting your special masses on the radio. Hearing the Chrism Mass made me feel like I was right there, especially when I heard the uh, stirring of the oils and you breathing into the containers. Mm. Uh, tenebrae was also very moving. My question is, are the video and or audio from these special masses available for future use? I'd love to go back and catch what I may have missed and listen to your homily again. Thank you for making these broadcasts available, and thank God for Catholic Radio. Thank God for Catholic Radio. So, Ron, maybe you can answer the question of whether or not, in fact, video or audio from the masses are available for future use. Well, when we broadcast uh, and we broadcast Tenebrae and Holy Thursday, as well as Chrism Mass, which we usually do, and when we do that, those special masses, we do make a podcast of those available. Uh, if you go to the AnnunciationRadio.com slash podcasts, it'll take you right to the podcast page, and then there's a folder called Specials that you can click on and find just what you need. Perfect. So, uh, uh, Marilyn, I can say I join you, and thanks to Annunciation Radio and the good folks who take the time to tape those, and I'm just delighted that our folks who are not with us cannot be with us, perhaps physically present in the cathedral for those events, are able to be present for those Masses by audio. And so it's really great to have that opportunity. Pardon me. <laughs> yeah. But I think it was it's terrific. And first of all, thank you for listening. And it's terrific that you would even pay such careful attention, you know, to the hearing of the stirring of the oils, because you can hear that that large glass stir I have stirring in the in the fusti. And obviously the breathing on the oils, which is part of the ritual of the prayer over the chrism. And so it's, it's great to hear also how moved you were by Tenebrae. There were more people at the cathedral this year for Tenebrae than we've remembered in recent past years. So not only are we so thrilled that people come physically, but very thrilled that people follow and listen and engage and encounter the liturgy by radio and then maybe later by podcast. So thanks so much, Marilyn. And it really, I think it makes the, the, the cathedral and, and you... And, uh, and really these, these beautiful liturgies uh, kind of more intimate for everybody. Everybody can kind of join in. So. And it makes it everything accessible, and that's, that's a great gift. And I know, for example, also on my Facebook page, we post images uh, of photos that have been taken by a photographer during those major liturgies. And when those are posted, there's a tremendous reaction because I think people are able also to feel as if they were there and engaged in those sacred moments. So it's another way to make, make the liturgy accessible to people during Holy Week. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that question, Marilyn. Uh, let's go to uh, Dick in Maumee. Uh, we're, you know, we're not too far removed from Lent now. Uh, I know. Bishop and, and, uh, and Dick says, Dear Bishop, uh, what did you give up for Lent this year? <laughs> And uh, what did you do spiritually during Lent? Well, I think, Ron, we actually had this question during Lent from another, maybe it was another questioner. But, Dick, I have to tell you, if I told you what I gave up, I'd lose all grace. So I don't want to lose the grace that I may have gained, please God, by giving things up or by doing things special spiritually. But as I, as I had mentioned before, of course, one of the things I always do is give up chocolate. And I've given that up since a child. But, you know, the ways of a child are the ways of a child. So as I've grown as an adult into the spiritual life, I've also recognized that Lent isn't just about, as, as you hint, Dick, it's not just about giving things up to discipline our bodies, but it's also about doing things positively in a particular way, acts of charity and kindness. So while, Dick, I won't share with you what I did because I'd lose all grace if I told you, <laughs> I will encourage you and others next year, maybe even now, to plan for next year what it might be. And I always recommend, folks, that one of the things you try to do is to seriously address 
some sin or some weakness by whatever practice you're undertaking, whether that be the fasting or the almsgiving, but that it specifically address it and that it be intentional because that's what I find to be the most fruitful and productive. And oftentimes, Ron, I'm sure you, you've heard people say this, things that people give up during Lent, they do so well with it and they find they don't need it the rest of their lives and they just stop doing it. So I remember one Lent, for example, one time a friend said to me, well, I gave up sugar in my coffee and ever after that, Lent ended, but I just continued it in Easter. And then they gave up coffee altogether, I have to tell you. <laughs> but sometimes we simply keep on going in our spiritual lives with the practice that we started in Lent. And, you know, I've talked to some people who uh, have, during Lent, done more spiritual reading and spent more time in prayer. Absolutely. And then at the end of that 40 days, it's like, that's the new habit that I formed. That's a beautiful and I'm example. stay with it. And I know it's a wonderful example. And also, Dick, there are folks, for example, who they incorporate maybe a daily mass or other daily masses in their Lenten practice or visits or adoration to the Blessed Sacrament or, for example, tithing themselves to give a particular amount to the poor. And then those good practices continue after Lent. So what a gift it would be if those things simply become ingrained in one's regular spiritual life. Mm -hmm. All right, Bishop. Let's uh, let's move on. Uh, this Thank one, um, this was sent anonymously, and uh, I know Bishop. You generally don't take anonymous questions, but uh, sometimes the uh, type of question it is, uh, it might be a little uh, a little touchy. Surely, and I think we've taken some anonymous questions in the past, also given their nature, and I think this is one of them, Ron. Thank you. It uh, reads, Bishop Thomas. I am a forty-nine year old man in the middle of a dissolution of my marriage and suffer from same-sex attraction. I feel called to the church, but understand I have issues which would keep me from serving in many positions. Are there ministries that are available to explore? Thank you, and to our writer, and of course again, maintaining the anonymity, to our writer, I first have to say I, I, I extend my prayerful, my prayerful uh, regards and my concern to you especially as the dissolution of your marriage is taking place and because of your own personal challenges and struggles. So first of all, I would have to say that the reality is I apologize, but I simply don't know the particulars of your case. So when you say I feel called to the church, for example, uh, for our listeners and viewers, I, I don't know, for example, if the writer is a Catholic, is not a Catholic, if the writer has been a practicing Catholic, whether the writer was in a Catholic marriage. So there's an awful lot of unknown here. And, and dear, dear writer of that question, please know that it's hard for me to respond since I do not know so many of the particulars. So for example, you say, I feel called to the church. You may not be Catholic. And then you say, I have issues which would keep me from serving in many positions. I simply don't know what those are because I'm not privy to them in this brief question. So my greatest, my greatest recommendation would be here that you would consider both identifying and speaking to a priest nearby you who you would feel comfortable with and able to have a sincere and open conversation with. Because in that way, then in the private setting and confidentiality of your meeting, that priest might be able to understand more deeply all of the concerns, your situation, and your struggles, and help you, whether it's to enter the church or continue in the church. So whatever it might be, please, I would invite you to have a good conversation with a priest who would be able to sit down and assist you in this way. Very good, Bishop. And I know uh, Courage uh, International uh, may be a, a benefit to, to this writer as well. Um, Absolutely, and that's one example. And you know, they they are online. There, you can find them on the internet. And courage, of course, is a particular apostolate. But again, Ron, this person doesn't say he is or isn't Catholic because he indicates I feel called to the church. So that may mean he's not Catholic. But either way, courage is an apostolate for those who experience same-sex attraction. And it's faithful to the church and very, very helpful to people in that situation. And so I think that's a fine recommendation to consider. Thank you. 
Very good. Well, Bishop, if, uh, I don't think we're going to have time to get to our next question. We can't. I'm we shocked. Might, we might have to hold that for the next uh, Bishop Corner <laughs> session. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's been a quick half hour. And uh, uh, as always, uh, we ask uh, Bishop to close us with a prayer, a blessing that we can take with us. Surely. So our prayer, of course, as we always do, as the gospel comes from the previous Sunday, so the prayer. Let us pray. God of everlasting mercy, who, in the very recurrence of the Paschal Feast, kindle the faith of the people you have made your own. Increase, we pray, the grace you have bestowed, that all may grasp and rightly understand in what font they have been washed, by whose spirit they have been reborn, by whose blood they have been redeemed. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Ron, thank you for filling in and co-anchoring today. We're so grateful and grateful for all the folks who watch and listen. And again, everywhere I go, folks tell me that they listen and watch. And I'm so grateful for that and hope you will continue to do so and pray for each other in this holy Easter season. That's right. Keep those questions coming, folks, and uh, be sure to join us for the next edition of the Bishop's Corner.